Hi there, and welcome to another edition of Success Stories. Today, we've got a fantastic influencer called Zach, and um, I'm going to welcome him, welcome him straight to the studio. Hi, Zach. How you doing? How's it going? I'm doing good. Nice to see you with your biceps out. Um, I always, yeah, good, good. Um, so I always start with the first question that everybody has heard me ask. How did you become carnivore? Well, um, I had a long history of uh, eating, I, I call it terrible food now or, or, or species inappropriate foods, but I grew up in, 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 South, in, in the South in the United States, which is very well known for terrible, you know, just terrible foods. Um, I had, you know, just a long history of eating pizza and pasta and all kinds of stuff. I was always in really good shape, but mentally um, I hadn't realized, uh, you know, how, how much all those foods had impacted me. Um, I started having relationship problems. I, I was addicted to drugs. I was drinking a lot. Um, I, I'm married with two kids and, you know, some of those uh, issues that I was having, mental issues I was having was impacting my, my relationship. So, you know, as far as overcoming addiction, there's not a lot of information out there and there's not a lot of actual success stories. Um, so what I realized in my life was that my addiction also was me being addicted to other things. So it's basically trying to find something to fill a void. Being addicted to food was one thing that I wasn't aware that I was that I was doing. So I was always in the gym, right? I was always working out. I was always in relatively good shape, but I had terrible, my A1C wasn't great. My blood work was always pretty, pretty terrible. The doctors would always be like, hey, your cholesterol is too high or your blood sugar is too high, this and that. Um, so even though I was in good shape, I wasn't in great shape inside. And, you know, I came to a point where some stuff happened in my relationship and I was like, I got to make some changes. And I went online. I was like, how to overcome addiction. And there was a video about something that Dr. Chafee made, Dr. Anthony Chafee, he's, he's probably the first person that I came across in the carnivore space. And he said something that made a lot of sense. He's like, we're, you know, when we, when we aren't addicted to our food, all of the other things kind of go by the wayside. We're not constantly striving to, you know, we eat because we want to eat, not because we're addicted to it. So I was able to start strict carnivore and it's been a little over a year. Um, my life has changed. My, my body mass has changed. My, um, my relationship has changed. My habits have changed. You know, my relationship with my kids has changed. So it's been, it's been a, uh, an awesome experience overall. Fantastic. So uh, reasonably fresh to carnivore. So what was you before that? Was you just standard American diet or had you tried other ways of eating? Yeah, well, I was like, I was that guy that said, oh, I, you know, I, I work out, I can eat whatever I want, right? So which, you know, maybe when you're younger it might be true, but the problem is, is those, those, you know, even, even things like salad, plant toxins, all that stuff, that stuff builds up, right? And you, you think that you're invincible when you're young, right? Um, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at 30, three or 34. Um, and, you know, so I'm 37 now that, you know, that those kind of things all started hitting you when you're in your thirties. And, you know, you, I thought to myself, there's no way I would, you know, I, I, I thought, to, you know, I was invincible that because I worked out that everything would work out. Yeah. Um, so has the Crohn's resolved? Completely gone. Yeah. Well, there you go. There's a big tick straight away. When you got it, um, did everyone tell you that was it? You'd never get rid of it? Yeah, that, I mean, well, if you, so, when you when you first hear that you have, you know, you, you get something like that, you go online and you you try to figure out, hey, what causes it? You know, how do I stop it? Um, you know, and all the information online is is wrong, right? I, I'm actually so my wife is a naturopathic doctor who's also a carnivore as well, um, and you know, I grew up in this. Like I said, I grew up in the South eating lots of gluten, lots of bread, pasta, and naturopaths are, are, it's pretty well known in their community that gluten causes problems, right? So I actually stopped eating gluten when I met my wife, which was before I got Crohn's, okay? So what happens when you take away gluten? Usually they replace it with some sort of seed powder, right? Like almond flour and this and that. So one thing leads to another. I developed Crohn's. I started looking into it and all of the, all the different things that I had replaced with almond flour and almonds, um, I'm fairly sure caused my Crohn's because I checked my, I'm actually really allergic to almonds and I had spent my whole life and never knew that because it was just a health food that I rarely ever ate, if, if anything at all. Um, so I actually caused my own like, you know, problems by trying to be healthy because I mean, both, both were inappropriate and wrong, right? So it's just an interesting story how that how one thing led to another. Yeah, I mean almonds 
aren't healthy, are they? For many people, they are quite actually destructive. That's what I, that's what I found. So you've been doing this nearly a year. Um, any other resolutions of issues? It's been over a year. Um, you know, the big, the biggest ones for me um, have actually been in, in, in the mental health aspect. And not that not I wasn't depressed or anything before, but um, you know, I, I, I had an affinity for violence my whole my whole life. I have right. I, I kind of I had a rough childhood. I was I was sent to a boarding school when I was 16, all the way till I was 18. So I was basically incarcerated for, you know, right before I became an adult. Um, so you know, I have I just have a long history of that. And I, and what I've realized is that a lot of my responses were from brain inflammation from the foods that I was eating. Right, just. And you don't know it until you get out, until the fog clears 100%. And it didn't, you know, it wasn't really overnight. It took three weeks um, to a month. But my, you know, for my wife to come to me and say, hey, you're like, you're a different person, you know, like, you're, you're a better father, you're a better husband, you're just a better person in general. I still, you know, kept a lot of my, my qualities that, that, that <laughs> I'm, I'm still kind of an aggressive person, not in the sense of like, I try to put people down, but if I have a message to get across, I'm going to get it across, right? I don't really care what people think about me. So to me, the ideas are more important than feelings. I say that all the time. So that's kind of my, my avenue at helping other people. I, I'm also a coach for Rivero. Uh, so I do help other people with, with the carnivore diet. Yes. And I mean, that's one of the things that attracted to me to you on Instagram. You're quite feisty. I quite like that. Um, when people are watching this, they're really interested because there's many people skeptical, um, even though I've done hundreds of, of these sort of things. Um, the resolution of Crohn's, they just don't believe, but obviously that's happened to you. There's, there's no reason for all these people to keep coming on and, and saying this has happened. One of the things I think about carnivore is you also take other things out of the diet, like seed oils. Do you have any particular opinions about seed oils? Well, yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, so. Here's, here's another reason why I, I uh, when, when I first started carnivore, about a month before I started carnivore, my wife actually ran my blood, my labs, and I had really high amyl peroxidase, which is a which is an inflammatory marker, and that marker is very prevalent in people that have heart disease, right? So I watched that marker for, for mild peroxidase um, go up until, you know, right before I started carnivore. And then that kind of led into a lot of different things that happened that I think was just like, hey, that's why I said, I need to change what I'm doing. Something's got to give. Um, I actually watched that inflammation take almost a year. It recently just went down to normal levels. So, and the only correlation that I really could make was, seed oils because I eliminated the seed oils and it takes a long time for that inflammation to leave your body, obviously based on what I was doing, but now it's completely, you know, it's all, it's, it's almost non-existent on, on the profile on my blood work. I I'm a hundred percent sure that that's the reason because of just, just knowing what I was doing before and what, what happened afterwards. And yeah, seed oils are probably the number one threat to your health as far as your cardiovascular system. So if you, if you, you know, because people always say, oh, well, carnivore is too hard. I'm like, well, there's some social aspects of it that make it difficult. I understand that. Not everybody has the willpower. You know, if you're addicted to sugar, that's, that's going to make it difficult. You know, there's just some people that don't want to do it because it's hard. But if you could do one thing for your health, I think avoiding seed oils is like number one rule, you know? Yeah, Anyone, you mentioned, even the, go ahead. Yeah, you, you mentioned the addiction there. So obviously, you have a that streak in you being addictive um mm -hmm. do you feel that sort of the cravings and the addiction to to everything is less now you're eating this way well you know the interesting part is i don't feel like i'm addicted to anything now right i don't so i'll give you an example i eat once a day and i usually eat about four o'clock and you wouldn't believe the backlash i get from people in like body you know like people that work out they're like how do you only eat once a day and maintain your muscle mass i'm like I don't feel that my body, uh, you know, if, if there was something that I was missing, my body would ask for it, right? I would be hungry. I don't really get hungry until about two, I start getting hungry about two o'clock, right? And it's not a hunger, like it's a physiological hunger as opposed to a craving, which is different. And if you've never experienced, if you, if you fast, you understand what I'm talking about because when you when you're fasting and towards the end when you start to do when you start to get hungry you feel it in your jaw right your teeth you like it's it's like all these different hormones start pumping up and it's, it's very different than the traditional 
you know, I had something, you know, with a lot of sugar in it two hours ago, and now I'm going to eat again because it's been two hours, right? It's not the blood sugar up and down. So I, that's not an addiction, right? Whereas when you're craving sugar, to me, that is 100% addiction. All drugs, most of all the drugs, right? There, I can give you one example of, of that's not, but all drugs are, are plant-based, right? So any addictive substance is most likely caused by plants, which is basically sugar anyway, right? But there's only one, there's only one drug that's not, but it's, a, it's DMT, but DMT is actually the one hormone that is actually found in both plants and in animals. So it's something that we both share. So it's an interesting, interesting fact. It is. Um, you mentioned fasting there. You're, you're saying you eat one minute a day. Do you fast ever? Yeah, I mean, that's basically almost 24 hours every day. When I say one meal a day, I what I mean is from about four o'clock to about whenever I'm done, I eat. Mm -hmm. So it could be, you know, if I eat a whole lot and I'm not hungry, then that could be 30 minutes or that could be I could eat till six o'clock. So within a two hour window, maybe sometimes longer, it just depends. I try to eat all my food in a two to three hour window. Brilliant. I'll, probably I'll rephrase the question. Do you do extended fasting? I have. Uh, I did initially in the beginning. Um, I, you know, if I feel something off, sometimes I feel like that that helps. I did have a huge problem in the beginning, and I, and I almost thought that I wasn't going to stay carnivore, and that was I was eating too often, and I didn't realize that that was actually stressful and hard on the body. So when I started eating meals closer together, I started feeling better. And then initially when I couldn't figure out what was going on, I started, I did fast. So I would do like, you know, 48 hours. The longest I've ever fast was 10 days, but that was actually years ago when I was doing, when I tried to do keto. Ah, okay. Well, mm -hmm. you see, the problem is with saying something like that, Zach, I've got to ask you. So why did you try keto and why didn't it work? Well, honestly, the reason I, I stopped keto, this was years ago. I, I, I got too lean and too small. I actually lost muscle mass. Um, my thyroid kind of started like on blood work, kind of went crap. And then I started losing hair. That's the actual reason. My hairline started receding when I went on a, a, keto, a keto diet. Um, it's actually stopped, but the, you know, the damage is still done. It hasn't improved or, or, you know, so that, that was kind of one of the, the, one of the main reasons I stopped, but in general, I just didn't feel great. You know, now I have lots of energy. Um, I don't get any bloating, you know, I don't have Crohn's anymore, but with, with keto, I, you know, I still, I still had issues with, with, uh, digestion. Yeah. I think, I, I think, um, as we've sort of touched on that and the fact you train, what are your macros like? Do you prioritize protein or do you add fats? What do you do? Uh, I what I do now is is a little bit different than what I've done this this whole. That's the thing. The other thing about carnivore is that we have to change and adapt a lot, right? Because we we get tied into like, oh, I've been doing this for three months and it's it's been great, but all of a sudden some something comes along and it's like, bam, that doesn't work anymore. I got to adapt, right? Uh, what I do now, I don't count calories. I only eat fatty cuts of meat. I eat a little bit of seafood with, with whatever I'm eating. So I mix red, red meat and seafood. So usually scallops. Um, and I feel better with scallops for, for taurine and then salmon for omega-3. Sometimes I'll eat shrimp, but you know, you just out of boredom, but every day I eat red meat or try to eat some form of red meat. And then I add tallow. Uh, so an interesting thing, we probably would have gotten to this anyway, but I'm actually allergic to dairy. So uh, even butter, I can't, if, you know, if it's, if it's processed, you know, most butter still has a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, whey protein and, and different types of stuff in it that come over from the process. So even butter will, will sometimes give me some, some pretty, not anaphylactic type shock, but I'll, I'll have like heart palpitations and just not feel good and get itchy and stuff. So I actually have to add tallow instead of butter. So I add a little bit of tallow. I eat eggs. Usually when I make steak, I'll add a couple of eggs with it. Try to keep it simple too. Yeah, that's good. So um, I suppose the million dollar question is, uh, do we need to eat carbohydrates, especially when we're training? So I hear this a lot, I, like, <laughs> you know, especially people in the workout. And so protein synthesis, as far as I know, from the actual breakdown of the pathway can use either one, right? So you can use glucose or you can use fat for protein synthesis, which is all the muscles require. Is there a preference in the body? I don't think so. One, 
sugar is obviously a, a faster, more direct, easier pathway for the body to use. However, it's, you know, when we put race fuel in, into an engine, the wear and tear is higher, right? So sugar has end products that are oxidative. Uh, you can, you know, there's advanced glycation end products is one thing you could look up. You know, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, so yes, we can use both of these things as fuel, but one of them is like using race fuel in a car, right? It's, it's actually, it's burning the engine a little bit hotter than it needs to. And it's, it's going to have some, it's going to leave behind some damage. Is the intensity a little bit different than it was before? Probably, but I was also drinking uh, uh, pre-workout and stuff. So I also had caffeine. My workouts now, I'm just, just there's absolutely zero difference in strength. Um, the only thing I would say is intensity might be a little bit different, but I can also work out for longer periods of time without getting gassed. So I don't need to, you know, cause like I used to work out for two, three hours a day and I would always bring something to the gym to eat, right? Because you you get hungry because it's been two hours since you've eaten. Um, I don't need to do that. As a matter of fact, I worked out this morning for almost two hours and I haven't had anything to eat today. And I could go outside and, you know, lift again if I wanted to, and I, I would feel perfectly fine. Whereas a lot of people that eat sugar, they would have to eat after they worked out or they would be shaky or my blood sugar is low and this and that. I don't have that problem anymore, which is great. I think that's more effective because I'm strong the whole day, not just, you know, after I've had something to eat. Brilliant. Zach, for those people that are listening on the podcast and can't see, uh, Zach proves pretty much you can build muscle without carbohydrates. Okay. And this is one of the, my bugbears is I've been doing this for a long time. Last year, I did an experiment, gained nine pounds of muscle at age 57. Yeah. Um, again, for those on the podcast, can't see Zach's reaction. Zach doesn't know me that well, but yes, great biceps, but on YouTube, we can see it. So it's fantastic. Uh, and that is a question that bugs me because there are many people out there. Sean Baker, another great example, doesn't eat carbohydrates, looks pretty good. And Chafik, actually, who you mentioned earlier, also doesn't eat carbohydrates. It seems to do pretty well. Can I, make, um, can, I, can I add one caveat to that? Yeah, yeah. So, and this is very, very important. I, I, so human beings now live in a very high stress environment. When it comes to working out, if you are the type of person that is high stress and high cortisol, you might have a problem being carnivore and gaining muscle. And there's the, the reason why is because high cortisol keeps elevates blood sugar, right? And this is like higher than just the normal cortisol that you get from, from natural working out. But high stress people, your body, when you're in a high stress environment, wants to use immediate fuel or your body releases uh, sugar from your liver. And you'll, and, and, and one way to find out if this is you or not is a lot of people, when they wake up in the morning, if you have high blood glucose, if you wake up, you're like, Hey, why am I waking up? And my blood sugar is hundred, 110, probably in a high stress. Right. So the people that, that are, are high stress that go to the gym and, and have that kind of, um, you know, Hey, I don't have the energy that I was, that I had before. That is actually a reason why and it's very important. And it's very overlooked because your body doesn't want to put on muscle when it's afraid of dying, right? Because that's, that's the thing, you're running from a, a lion or something like that. But now we're running from the kids or our wives or work or whatever, that's still stress, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling because uh, you sound very like me. <laughs> well, I, think, I think we're pretty much on the same page, but I like to keep out of the discussion and just let whoever I'm talking to shine because I, I think the information coming from so many different sources is much better than hearing me saying it time and time again. Uh, one of the things I'd like to touch on, because we've been quite broad, we've talked about you, we've narrowed down to what you actually eat. But one of the things I noticed you talked about was us being obligate carnivores. And I wondered if you could just go into that form for everybody, please. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, I get into arguments about this a lot. And a lot of people, they, they want to argue the semantics of the definitions. And they say, so I'm not arguing in the definitions. I think the definitions are all correct. I'm saying that human beings are incorrectly placed in the wrong category and that we should be we should be placed in the obligate category. And there's two two main reasons is we don't need to eat plants in any way to survive, right? And we are obligated to eat meat to achieve all of our essential nutrients. There's not a single essential nutrient that exists in a plant that we can't get from meat. But the opposite is not true. There are many, if not all, and not to mention the plant-based nutrients are not in their most bioavailable form. 
which means that the plant is smart and it knows, hey, let me attach, you know, something that's going to disrupt this animal's gut to the iron or to the vitamin, whatever, right? So it's it's more complex. The plants don't want you to, to achieve those nutrients because they want to live, right? All, all, all creatures want to live. Um, our most bioavailable form of all nutrients exists in meat, right? All of our essential nutrients exist in meat. There's nothing in plants that we have to have to survive. Therefore, they're irrelevant. They're not, they're not, they're non-essential, right? So, and then people will say, well, an obligate carnivore, and if you look up the definitions, they talk about cats and, you know, different things. And one of the other points is, that's made is that, hey, you know, a cat will get sick when it eats plants. And I, and, and I think, okay, well, I mean, we all seen the fat cats, right? Those are from cats that are fed grain. Cats get sick and they start developing the same diseases that human beings are starting to, you know, well, actually we've, we've, we've had heart disease. I, I actually just showed a picture to a buddy of mine. It's a scan of a 43 year old Egyptian princess from 5,000, you know, 4,600 years ago. And we all know that the Egyptians were famous for their beer, their bread, and they did eat meat, but they were famous for their beer and their bread, right? And she's, her, she's got coronary calcium that's like, it looks like she's, you know, like she should be 600 pounds or something. I mean, she's got coronary, she's got all of her arteries in her legs, all the arteries in her heart, arteries in her neck. I'll send you that picture if you want. It's pretty interesting. But you, you we think, oh, well, you know, we can eat both, but really, can we? Let's look at our current, I actually have this information pulled up so I can pull up. So one in two women, one in three men will develop cancer in their lifetime. 87%, this is just America. I don't know what the numbers are globally, but in America, 87.7% of our entire population is, is, has metabolic disorder at some level, which is prediabetes or diabetes, right? One in every two people get heart disease. That means if there's two people in the room, one of you is gonna get a heart attack in your lifetime, right? There are more than 100 autoimmune diseases and 50 million, Amer 50 million Americans have one or more autoimmune disease. I was one of them, right? So yeah, can we eat plants? Like all the evidence kind of points in the, in the direction that we really shouldn't because why would we have these kind of numbers? And people say, well, it's caused by processed foods. Well, processed foods are really concentrated forms of the foods that I'm telling you not to eat anyway, right? So if I could, if I, why would I eat something that is poisonous in concentrated form, but not in its non-concentrated form? Why don't I just avoid it altogether, right? Um, we have five organs for breaking down fat. We only have one that's, that's to remove sugar, really, right? The pancreas's job is to lower your blood sugar, not to, you know, it's not a positive thing. It wants to get rid of sugar as fast as possible. Um, there's multiple plants that make us sick instantly that cause us to vomit, right? I actually have a list of those. I don't really know what they are, but I, I, I pulled up a list for it. But so all of the evidence points that we shouldn't be eating these things, you know? Even fruit, I, in my opinion, fructose is a, is a is a toxin. It's broken down in the liver like all other toxins, right? It's not absorbed through the gut like sugar like sugar is. Um, it's broken down in the aldehyde pathway, which is the same pathway that your body deals with alcohol, right? There's no benefit. It, it, and there's three there's three end products to the breakdown of fructose: uh, acetate, which is oxidative reactive oxygen species, which is oxidative, and then triglycerides, which is great if you want to put on fat, right? Mm, yes. Uh, yeah, I've got a carousel I'm doing for uh, Instagram on that very subject, which mm -hmm. should be out in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, and that's, I mean, the main nutrients I always argue about is, ob the obvious one is B12, mm -hmm. iron, and omega-3 fatty acids. So, I mean, they're three big hitters. Um, plants do not have heme iron. They have non-heme iron. That's definitely not efficiently uh, worked out through the body. So, and I also, I, I like the fact that there's arguments about our teeth and things like this from, from the plant-based community. Well, my teeth, apart from being British and rubbish, and also the product of a plant-based diet that my mum put me on for about 20, well, 15 years, um, I have incisors. I have that, you know, they're not flat. They're bicuspid. So all the arguments that I ever see, they're not even correct when they talk about anatomy. And then when you look at the collagen long bones from all our ancestors, they're all full of uh, proof that we ate basically animals. So uh, that's why I got you on, because I knew it was something you were a bit passionate about. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you really enjoy the science and all the uh, physiology. 
yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of, and that's, that's really what I use, right? I don't, um, you know, I follow a lot of uh, really smart people, right? I mean, Bart K is, I, I like Bart K, one, his personality is great because it's like, here's the information. I don't really care how, how you feel about it. And I, I love that because to me, I, you know, and, and especially in the carnivore space, I see a lot of people get upset about the info, you know, they get set not, not not necessarily because of the information, but because they don't like the information. They want to immediately say, "Well, I don't like the way it was said. I don't like I don't like that person, right?" So he shouldn't be saying that. And to me, you know, if I was about to walk off a cliff, and some some guy, you know, yelled at me, "Hey, hey, jackass!" Like, stop walking, right? I'm not going to be mad at him that he called me a jackass because he just saved my life, right? Call me whatever you would like to call me, but tell me the truth. And give it to me straight, right? Where we, and, but now we live in a society that really doesn't understand that. They care about how things are said and not what is said, right? Mm, yes, and they attack the person because they can't attack the facts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, I noticed you mentioned your wife is carnivore. Is that is that relatively new? Who who was first into this? Yeah, I was I was first. My wife, uh, like I said, she's a naturopathic doctor, and then they they basically worship plants out of school. They teach them like, hey, you know, they're they're basically vegan by the time they leave medical school. Um, but they, hey guys, go outside, okay? Um, sorry, my kids, my kids are in the background playing. Yes. Um, but she, she she when I first did it, she was like, she was kind of happy that I was trying to do something to change what was going on, but she was like, man, you know, this can't last. Like you're gonna you're gonna have a heart attack. You're gonna be dead in a month you know? And one thing, if you ask her why she switched and her transition was slower than mine, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that she watched how my, how I changed. My skin got better. The white of my eyes got better. I started sleeping better. I was being nicer. You know what I mean? So she started seeing all these different things happen. And she was like, man, there's gotta be something to this. So I think she was probably three at most four months behind mine. I don't really know, like I, we didn't keep track of it, but I would say she started eating more meat and slowly pulling stuff away. But you know, she lost 30 something pounds. She's had two kids. She's the leanest, most like, you know, muscular she's been in her entire life. And I'm pretty sure it happened when she, she used to eat salads every day. So she stopped eating salad and started eating red meat almost every day. And I mean, the weight just like started coming off, right? So it was, it was actually more, it was like, she had more of a physical change than I did, right? Mine was more like mental and, you know, I didn't really have a lot of weight to lose. I did, you know, I, I lost some visceral fat, but watching her transition was just, was amazing. You know, all of her hormones got better. She actually changed, like her personality was, you know, changed a little bit. So everything was positive for sure. That's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I might invite her on. Do you reckon she would do a follow-up interview? For sure. Yeah, absolutely. She's, she loves doing that. She's very passionate oh. about it as well. Cool. Um, now, I, they're not sound effects. It's children in the background. Uh, do they eat carnival? How do, how do they get on? Yes, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult with kids. And it's not um, my, my youngest. My youngest son, he's, he just turned two. He's basically a pure carnivore. Like He will choose meat over anything else. My daughter, she's five. Obviously, you know, we didn't start being carnivore until she was like oh, go close to four. So she was exposed to more stuff. She has a sweet tooth, right? So if you give her an option of like, hey, here's candy and here's steak, she's going to choose the candy because it's just like, you know, that's just how we're programmed to go after that fast fuel. Um, but we, every morning I make them, um, we do eggs and we do ground beef for them. I don't eat in the morning, but I make them, I wake up. The first thing I do is cook ground beef and eggs. And to me, I think that that's important because one, I'm getting those, those nutrients into them first thing. Right. So I'm not necessarily worried about, um, you know, the rest of the day, what they eat. I try to give them, you know, meat every single meal. Um, but we, we keep, there's only two fruits in our house. There's oranges. Um, and then there's pineapple and they have a choice between those two, if they want to eat that. And most of the time, the fruit doesn't get touched, but if they want something, they're allowed to have it. So I don't push it too hard. Hey, sorry, uh, I'm going to edit this bit out. My dog's just come in. Um, <laughs> I think he needs the call of nature, but we're wrapping uh, up anyway. So I'm, I'm going to cut that bit out and uh, we'll start from here. Anyway, uh, 
Well, that, that's that's fascinating, actually. So you've been the example. So what about um, friends and colleagues? Do they give you much pushback or are they quite supportive? Um, I, I like begrudgingly, I have converted all of my friends. And when I say that, I mean, they 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 fought to a lot of them have fought tooth and nail. Now, most of them now were, will they're huge carnivore advocates because they they they've seen all the benefits and you know that now now they're on my side but yeah so it, and that's the hardest part about the carnivore diet i believe is be, is is the social aspect and you know like what i was talking about with the kids the hardest part for my youngest for my old oldest zoe is that she goes to school and she sees all the other kids eating these things or she goes to a birthday party and you know it's it's just difficult so the main thing that I see people struggle with is like, hey, I'm going over to my dad's house. What do I eat? Right. How do I how do I explain it to them that I'm not going to eat the stuff that I've always ate when I've gone over there for my whole life? And you have to make that choice. Right. You have to decide what's appropriate, like what's appropriate food for me. Right. What is food for Zach? I don't think that, you know, birthday cake or or chips or dip and all that kind of stuff. To me, I have no desire to eat any of that stuff because it's not it's not food for me. Right. So I've changed my relationship with food as opposed to just saying, hey, I'm on a diet. No, it's not a diet. This is how I live. Right. If I eat something that's inappropriate, I know that it's going to hurt my stomach because I've, you know, there's been a few times that I've had stuff. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. So I don't want to cheat because there's no benefit to it. Right. Two second, two second benefit of putting something sweet in your mouth. It doesn't, you know, it's just not worth it. I mean, being the example is basically what you're saying. You have been the example because people have seen the difference and they've come over to your way of eating, which you can't beat being the example. Um, so if people want to contact you, how do they do that? Um, I'm on Instagram. Uh, it's at, uh, at Carnivorous Z, which is carnivorous, and then it's Z at the end. Um, we actually have a Facebook group. I think I invited you to the Facebook group. I think you're in there. Um, it's carnivore, harder, happier, healthier on Facebook. It's a great group. There's a, you know, there's a ton. Um, Dr. Tafey's in there. We have Dr. Kilt's in there. We have a lot of like Dr. Ken Berry's in there. Um, there's a lot of really good names. Um, you know, there's people that have been carnivore for long periods of time. There's lots of different coaches. Um, and it's a nice group. There's no like, like it's, it's not one of the hate groups. There's a lot of those Facebook groups can get kind of rough. Um, but then, you know, my wife is also uh, at Dr. Solt, S-O-L-T on, on, on um, she's, she's great to follow. Cause I mean, she's one of the, there's very few carnivore doctors in, in the, uh, in the, you know, in the space now. So, um, and then, yeah, so Facebook is just Zach Solt. Well, Zach, thanks for your time. Uh, I mean, people have been listening to this because they're interested in training. Well, that isn't the end of their journey, because if they want to listen to somebody else who's an expert, then I suggest they look at this video for Bronson Dent.